our last step in Kintsugi is about, so just to refresh your memory, we talked about breaking, assembling, waiting, repairing. And now we're at the place where we're taking a step back and we're looking at what we've created after this thing has been broken and we've repaired it. And I think a lot of that is going to be happening in the fall. But as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about historically times where things were very broken and then what came out of those things that are really beautiful and that we would recognize Anthony in the same way that you're saying like in 10 years 15 years we're going to say I cannot believe that it ever was like this we have those times in our history where we look back and you know before this date everything was like this and then afterwards we're like I can't believe that that's how it was allowed to be Anthony, good to see you. Great to be seen. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, Lindsay is keeping up her record for almost, I think she missed one, but otherwise perfect attendance, which is pretty amazing because this is our 19th cap and gown. So that's like, she's going to get a top fan award. How many have we done together? Oh, we've done a lot, Anthony. I mean, we maybe have done... 25 25 I'm wow. gonna have to go count and you keep inviting me back yeah <laughs> I love it when we get to spend time together um I had to cancel last week so I was gonna be with Matt last week but I had allergies and I sounded like a man I was like hello and that's like, <laughs> maybe maybe we won't do it this week. So I had to get- I'm glad you're feeling better. And I'm sorry, I didn't ask you how you're feeling. No, that's okay. I do feel much, much better. Um, so today we are talking about our last step of Kintsugi, which has been our theme for the last couple of months. It's about a new form, but same essence. And so we're gonna talk about that today, but I have some really fun pictures to show. So if you guys are joining us on podcast, and you want to see the pictures today is an actually it's a pretty heavy picture day because I have a hotel impossible for us to do. And some of the pictures I'm going to try to describe, but I don't know that I will do them justice. So if you want to join us on YouTube or on Zoom, please do that so that you can see um, what I'm talking about. But you had an exciting thing that you did last week. Oh, wow. Right. You, I'm going to I'm going to call the police. <laughs> Stalker. Um yeah, it was Serendipity. <laughs> Serendipity is a legendary uh, ice cream shop, uh, hamburger joint, uh, famous for a foot-long hot dog. And my good friend is involved there. And uh, we did a podcast, and then he invited me with my uh, one of my kids. And it was, uh, it was fun, man. You could see the enthusiasm I had. Listen, you know, when we came to New York, I was very sad that Serendipity wasn't open yet because I just thought Lillian would love that. It's such a fun place. Um, and I'm so happy that they're back open and that they're, and it was busy. Yeah, it, 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 it's, well, it's going to be, it was busy when we were doing the podcast because there's a lot of press and it was busy at night. They, they held back and they only did 230 covers uh, They because they were, it was their first day. And I said to my daughter, I said, how do you think they did? And she goes, they did pretty good. I really liked it. And she was like, but usually it's like, oh, it was amazing. It was like, no, it was good. I, I enjoy, I go. We, they were open one hour and they <laughs> nailed it. Nice. Yeah. That's... You know, kids don't really understand. Or most people don't understand what goes into an opening of a restaurant. I yeah. mean, it's, it's insane. For sure. And I mean, you have been talking a lot on all of your shows about how now people are getting out and traveling and everyone's like, oh my gosh, we have to get up to capacity. We haven't done this in a while. We have to like get up to speed with what we're supposed to be doing. So uh, yeah, like I've been talking on my show, it's, 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 people are still listening. People are still coming on. We just found out we're in the top 2000 podcasts in the world. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, uh, congratulations. You know, when you look at 2000, you're like, well, all right, Joe Rogan's number one. Yeah. Uh, the difference between Joe Rogan being number one and me being 2000 is about a hundred million dollars. <laughs> well, and also, I mean, 2000 of all of the podcasts, that's amazing. And there was 470,000, I believe, podcasts uh, uploaded last week. Wow. Yeah. Oh, well, congratulations so, on yeah. that. That's amazing. Thank you. Um, also, you posted this picture and it made me very happy. Two yeah. p.m. on a Sunday. Are you guys back to having your your lunches? Yeah, it was our dinner on Sunday, two o'clock. And I never, ever, 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 ever post pictures of my food and my dinners from home. 
But I just looked at the meatball. I was really hungry. And I looked at the macaroni. I'm like, I need that in my belly. I should yeah. post it before it goes yeah. in my belly. I agree. I think it, I think it made everyone feel very homey. Um, okay. And this is the last picture I have of you. So you, I don't know where you are. You said, where am I? But I don't. Uh, I am in Tulum, Mexico. Oh, what is it? Tul what, spell it. Uh, Tulum, T-U-L-U-M. Okay. Was Tulum, that for Mexico. a show or was that for a it was for a show? Five star secrets. I have not been on vacation in three years, so I haven't done anything for me in a long time. <laughs> All so, your travel pictures assume it was for a show. Yeah, if, if you see me with a smile on my face and I'm in some exotic <laughs> destination, I'm being paid to be there. <laughs> <laughs> That's a pretty good deal, actually. Yeah. Okay, I wanted to show you this picture that I found. It's of a hotel in Iceland. And instead of a wake up call, Oh my God, that's amazing. Isn't that cool? So you can say like, hey, if the Northern Lights are amazing, call me and wake me up so I can go out in the balcony and, and oh look at it. Oh my God, I, I've been to Iceland. I've been to Norway. Uh, I've been to all those places. And I've seen the Northern Lights about four or five times. But that, what a great idea. I had I not know. even thought about that. I thought you would like that. I was like, that seems like something Anthony would come up with. So. Not only, like, it's like, duh, that's such a great <laughs> idea. Because what I would have to do is I'd go to sleep and my producer would have to have somebody up and to say, hey, it looks like it's going to be 4.15 a.m. I'll have somebody get up at 3.30 to make sure it's happening. And I won't wake you up until, like, you literally just, you know, jump out of bed with your suit on <laughs> and go to the uh, thing and look into the uh, camera and go. Literally, because I didn't want to be walking up every five minutes for the Northern Lights. That would have been very helpful. Yeah, I thought it was a genius idea. I thought you'd like it. Okay, it's time for 19 questions. Favorite thing ever. <laughs> okay, well, we the, today's theme is would you rather. Okay. Okay. Would you rather have the ability to move things with your mind or the ability to read minds? Move things with my mind. I don't want to read people's minds. I don't either. I think that's a terrible idea. I don't want to know. Stressful. I don't want to know. Okay. Would you, would you rather be forced to sing along or dance along with dance every along. song? Dance. dance along. Yes. <laughs> I can't sing and I won't sing in front of anyone. Okay. Would you rather be in jail for five years or in a coma for a decade? Coma for a decade. Okay. Would you rather. No, I take that back. I take that back. You do? I take that back because I'd miss, if I'm in jail for five years, at least I'll know what's going on with my children. That's true. <clears throat> they could come visit you. What's that? I said they could come visit you. Uh, right? Yeah. And, okay. I, and I can get phone calls and I know, you know, I'll know what's going on and I can threaten their boyfriends from jail. Hey, I'm in jail <laughs> for five years. I can make it 20. We just wait. <laughs> I'm not scared. Okay. Would you rather be chronically underdressed or overdressed? Overdressed. Would you rather... Um, would you rather give up air conditioning or heating for the rest of your life? Heating. Okay. Um, would you rather never be able to go out during the day or never be able to go out during the night? Night. Okay. Okay. This is a hard one. Matt and I had a lot of debate about this one because we answer all these questions before they, we give them to you. Would you rather be royalty a thousand years ago or an average person today? Average person today. Would you rather watch nothing but Hallmark Christmas movies or nothing but horror movies? Oh, Hallmark Christmas movies. I've <laughs> never watched a scary movie in my life. You know that. that. I've never watched one second of a scary movie in my life. Really? Listen, I, I tell you, I watch UFC 60 Minutes and Poker because there's enough <laughs> drama just living my life. I don't want everybody else's drama or everybody else. Why are you going to scare me? I don't want to be scared. I want, I want flowers, rainbows. That's all I want. <laughs> Hallmark, Hallmark, please. Okay. Would you rather spend a week in the forest or a night in a real haunted house? A week in the forest. Okay. Would you rather, okay, this is a hard one too. Would you rather find a rat in your kitchen or a roach in your bed? A rat in my kitchen. Yeah, me too. Okay, would you rather never eat watermelon again or have to eat watermelon with every meal? Watermelon with every meal. Because that's like, that's bliss. Oh, you love watermelon? Oh, who doesn't love watermelon? <laughs> would you rather have unlimited battery life on all your devices or free Wi-Fi wherever you go? Free Wi-Fi wherever you go. Because okay. I pay like $85,000 a month in Wi-Fi <laughs> with all my kids. <laughs> would you rather live in a treehouse or a cave? Treehouse. Would you rather give up your cell phone for a month or bathing for a month? Cell phone. <laughs> would you rather 
Would you rather have? I took, a- I took two showers already. It's only two o'clock. So. <laughs> You're like, I can't, I can't do it. I, I need that. Would you rather have photographic memory or an IQ of a hundred? Um, uh, sorry, of two hundred. Um, a photographic memory, because I think if you have an IQ of 200, you're a very probably scary person to be around. Okay, two more. Would you, ra- this is hard to, would you rather forget your wife's birthday or your anniversary every year? Um, <clears throat> my anniversary. But I can't, yeah. I, I can't forget it because it's on Valentine's Day. Oh, that was good thinking. Oh, it wasn't mine. It was my uh, father-in-law was hunting uh, every other weekend. So it was the only weekend that was available. <laughs> you couldn't come to the wedding. True story. Like you can, you can get married on this day. Okay. Last one. Would you rather lounge, lounge by the pool or at the beach? Pool. Really? All right. I learned something new today. You know what I think I'm going to do next time we meet, I'm going to do, would you rather, but I'm going to, I'm going to write down what I think you're going to say for everyone. And then All I'll right. just hold it up. And well, we'll you listen, that. you know me really well at this point. So you should be <laughs> able to do that. I feel like I could be pretty good at it. Okay, so let me tell you what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to do State of the Union. A lot of really interesting things are happening in higher education that I want to highlight. And then this is our last step in Kintsugi. So it is about form versus essence. And I'm going to talk about that in terms of some higher education foundations. And then I have a Hotel Impossible for us. I don't know if I can do this hotel impossible without crying. So you may just have to stick with me. I've oh, talked. I, like, I know what it is. I've tried to practice it, but I'm not. It's, it's the, I'm going to guess it's the one at Ocean City, Maryland. No, it's not. Oh, okay. Um, and then I'm going to talk about what we're going to talk about for fall 2021. So let me start with um, State of the Union. Some really fun things, actually, Anthony, as you and I have been talking about Kintsugi and like things are broken and people are coming up with creative solutions for them. So the first um, article I have for you is about a survey of 2000 college students and 4000 parents of learners between 11 and 17 across four countries. Um, <clears throat> what's really interesting is 80% of the parents surveyed said that their children are more cognizant of the plight of others coming out of this pandemic two thirds of college students say they have become more aware of social issues, including healthcare needs and racial equity. And then 90% of those polled revealed, this is so interesting to me, they consider internet access a basic human right that governments should be doing more to provide, which I love that because so much of the struggle is students who don't have access to internet. I was just talking about this this morning. I was in, I believe it was Finland. It could have been Sweden or Norway, but I'm not sure, but I believe it was Finland. I was in a snowbank um, in the middle of nowhere and we had free internet. And I said to the driver, I was like, I have internet. He goes, it's a basic human right. You're born with free internet in our country. I was like, what? It's like every single person that's born in that country has free internet for life. Wow, that's amazing. It is a basic human right because at this point, it's you like think about the internet without uh, during the pandemic. If we didn't have internet, yeah, I mean, you want to talk about more people would have died. More people would have died. Absolutely. So I love that outcome. Also, I feel like you said this months and months ago, but fifty percent of college students are now considering a change in career path coming out of the pandemic. Um, 45% of them leaning towards healthcare or science field, and then more than 50% of them say they want to own their own business. So you and I have been talking for a long time about you have this lockstep, like you do this, you do this, you do this. And when it breaks, it just opens up this opportunity. I, for I have a very, I have a fortune 500 company, actually <laughs> fortune 200 company I work with. And they just announced that all their employees are going back in the office, must be back in the office in, I think, call it a month. And I was talking to someone that I do business with, that I sign contracts with. And she said to me, uh, I said, how do you feel about that? She goes, not good. I go, why? She goes, because we're more efficient working one week from home, one week in the office. We don't need to be there, but everybody, they say team spirit and all that. And the young generation is refusing to go back in. And the older generation, uh, most of them want to go back in. And she's kind of in the middle because she's kind of not old or young. Yeah. And she's like, I don't really like it. I don't understand it. And we've learned that we're more, listen, I am much more efficient. Um, I never realized I would be just kind of doing my own thing than yeah. I am kind of having to you know, get up and go to 27 different things. Plus you have travel time, which is another huge thing, right? So if you're commuting, that's two hours of your time one way, like one, listen, one way. I was, I was at my <clears throat> pool just 10 minutes ago 
talking to a lawyer about something. And I literally got dressed, came up to my office and I was talking to you. I, 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 and I was able to drop my daughter off. I was able to go to the gym. I was able to have other zoom calls yeah. and, and I got everything done. Yeah. I think it's going to be really interesting to see the effect of that. Um, also you and I have been talking about the NCAA. So, you know, they've changed these rules. So now, now students have rights to their image and likeness, which is really fascinating. So Hersey Miller, who is a Tennessee state university athlete is one of the first he's 19, um, to win an endorsement deal. He is going to earn $2 million from this tech company, web apps, America. And what's really interesting about it, I think, especially for some of our smaller schools, is that you think about you might be recruited to be a third string quarterback at the University of Texas, or you could go to a smaller school and be their number one quarterback and get a local sponsorship where they're going to pay you some amount of money. Oh. It might sweeten the deal for you to go to a smaller school. So it's oh. going to be so interesting to no, see what and, and it's, it's it's same thing with Olympic athletes. I mean, come on, man. <clears throat> like these people are putting millions of dollars in a lot of people's uh, pocket and they're getting screwed over. And so fantastic. It's great. It's going to be a little sticky and a little slippery yeah. and a little ugly in the beginning, but you know, in 10 years, they'll be like, of course they're getting paid. Like, right. why would they get paid? It'll be like, what? They didn't get paid? I like, think that's It'll totally almost true. be like a foreign thought. Yeah, I think that's totally true. It's really interesting. LSU has already established their policy on student athlete name and likeness. And so they're like, here's what you can get paid for. Here's, you've got to make sure that it's not like drugs or alcohol. So they've already put out that because, I mean, athletes are moving fast on this. Why wouldn't you? If you could make $2 million. Especially, you got to remember, a lot of these athletes are coming from working at Wendy's right. and, and giving mom the paycheck. That's right. That's right. And and for athletes, thinking about being able to go to a school and make that kind of money is, I I mean, changes and, their future. And a lot of them will now get serious in high school saying, you know yeah. what, I don't, I don't, because, you know, you, you, you're you more likely to get picked up in college and get a sponsorship than you are, even if you're excellent, to get into the NFL. I mean, it's like, I think 1%. For sure. What is it? Less than 1% of all Less college D1 athletes get play professional sports, right? Yeah. Think about sure. it. D1 athletes, less than 1% play professional ball. That's crazy. Well, Anthony, I think it's so fascinating because as an expert of personal branding, if we said to high school students, hey, you need to take charge of your personal branding because whatever school you go to, if you're a good citizen, if you get good grades and you're a good player, those are people who are going to get endorsement deals from these, these local people who are willing to pay you. So I think just helping them think about their personal brand earlier is going to be a super and, helpful. And, and I would imagine that these branding companies will tag them with a mentor. Because yeah. that, that mentor has got to be talking to them every week. That's right. So actually, one thing that LSU is doing that I really like that they've included in that kind of prospectus is they've said, and we're going to give you lessons on how to budget, and we're going to tie you to a person so that you have a really clear idea of what you should do. So I think all around. And, and honestly, I think that that money should go in some kind of escrow until they they leave college. I yeah. mean, because you can't give a seventeen year old two million dollars. No, they need a trust for sure. Right. Okay, something else that's really interesting is Grubhub is partnering with Yandex, which is a company out of Russia, to um, use these robots. So, so it's really interesting. They're, um, they have these robots that deliver food on campus. So you order from Grubhub, and then these robots rove through to your res halls with your food, and they send you a push notification, and then you come out, and you can unlock it and get your food out. So you this unlock is- You probably with your phone, right? Yeah. Exactly. So this is something that's coming out of this idea that, you know, everything is broken. What are we going to do? This is going to be, um, I think, pretty. Yeah, I can't, you know, I, I hate to say it, but being an operator and being a guy that um, all he thinks about is what can go wrong in a hotel. I just see a, something, somebody running that over with a truck and like a McDonald's, like Big Mac being on the sidewalk and that being the image. Sad. <laughs> so they're pretty big. They're like 150 pounds. And they are from Russia. So the, the company is like, we're very good at like bad weather. But yeah, still, you can imagine. Right, yeah, right. you can imagine. Hey, listen, listen, like, listen, Tesla is a great product, but Tesla has had, unfortunately, some, some serious problems. Yeah. Uh, so they're going to, it'll be fun to see. Listen, again, it's going to come back to 10 years from now. That's going to, of course, that's how things are delivered. I know it. 
I know, which I love that idea that coming out of this, there are going to be things where we look back and we just think, what were we Listen, doing? How were 15, we not doing that? 15, 20 years ago, I did it on my podcast today. If you saw my podcast, reach for your cell phone right now. Go. Right. 20 years ago, think about that. We, like, we, I can tell anybody right now, I can call anybody, reach for your cell phone and show it to me. Yeah. Within one second. Did right. we ever think that we would have that tied to us like that? Just no. because we don't put it on as a suit or a shirt or socks or shoes, it, it's it's like, why? This is the only thing that is with us, like, clothes. All the time. That Thank you for saying that, because I told Matt the other day, you know what's had an amazing resurgence of importance? Back Close? pockets. What? No, what? back pockets. <laughs> Right? Like, what were you putting in your back pocket 20 years ago? Not much. But yeah. now if I have pants without my back, I'm like, where am I supposed to put my phone? I don't understand. Right, so right. yeah, things are a changing. That's yeah. for sure. Okay. The last one, and I know you're going to love this. This is out of Kingsborough Community College um, oh. in Brooklyn. You that's know where my, that is? That's my, that's my school. I actually, um, I, I did my one of my first keynote speeches there. A friend, it's a long story, but a friend of mine was there and he said, would you do one? And I did <laughs> one literally the first week I was uh, on TV. Okay, well, listen. My mother, went, uh, my my mother, my my wife, for the slept. My wife went to Kingsborough to get her associate's degree, got her bachelor's and master's from Brooklyn, and says the best education she ever got was from Kingsborough Community College. I'm so happy to hear that connection because their president, um, her name is Claudia Schrader. She's been uh -huh. the president for three years. Uh -huh. She has started doing welcome wagon meetings for all of her incoming students. So normally she would sit at the front of the gate and welcome the prospective students or the incoming students, uh -huh. but she hasn't been able to do that. So she's been doing meetings, go driving around to people's houses and meeting them outside and giving them some swag and saying, we're so excited for you to come. It's going to be really awesome. I can't wait to see you there, which, hello, you and I have been talking about this for a year. Is she with uh, the clients or is it just a press release? No, no, it's just a press release that wow. I was like, this is amazing. But they also are citing a lot of presidents, which I think this is going to come out of the pandemic. So Michael Lovell, the president of Marquette, uh, Marquette in Milwaukee, invites students to run with him every morning. Wow. Um, Edward Berger, the former president of Southwestern University in Texas, went around the, the campus with a golf cart chatting about students. And then Deborah Schwinn, who is at PBA, who is one of our clients, um, did personal Zoom calls with all of her students. So presidents are basically saying, like, we have got to be approachable. We have to make sure our students feel seen. I love that. I think it is such a great um, change, right? Then instead of just sitting in your office, that you're going out and you're seeing people. So I'm so glad you have that connection. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Kingsborough Community College is literally <laughs> where I grew up. It's right there. I'm where I played baseball was right near Kingsborough Community College. I mean, my my nieces went to Kingsborough. Kingsborough Community College is my college. Is our that community is very college. cool. Well, they serve a lot of first generation, lower income students, yep. and so what the president was saying was just it's so important that they feel welcomed and like they have a place here, and that they're not just kind of transient in and out, but that they're really important. And it's to our one community. of the most beautiful campuses you'll ever see. I don't know if you really? know. Oh my God, it's on the water. It's surrounded by the water. Wow. It's surrounded Wonderful. by the ocean. It's at the end of Manhattan Beach in Brooklyn. Uh, you have, obviously you have a lot of neighborhoods and um, a sheep set, um, <clears throat> Manhattan Beach is almost, I don't think it's a peninsula, but it's uh, where Kingsborough is when you kind of go, you have to go over a bridge or if you're driving, you have to go over this uh, highway. But then you, when you make that left, it's like multi-million dollar homes multi multi-million dollar homes and then you go all the way to the end of it at the um you know and there's kingsborough and it's surrounded on two sides by three sides by water wow okay well i'm gonna have to look it up next time i come to new york i'm gonna have to go visit them Gorgeous. okay so let's talk about our last step in kintsugi and i'm just gonna tell you guys i have um we're talking about history today the reason is because our last step in Kintsugi is about, so just to refresh your memory, we talked about breaking, assembling, waiting, repairing, and now we're at the place where we're taking a step back and we're looking at what we've created after this thing has been broken and we've repaired it. <clears throat> and I think a lot of that is going to be happening in the fall. But as I was preparing for today, I was thinking about historically times where things were very broken and then what came out of those things that are really beautiful and that we would recognize 
Anthony, in the same way that you're saying, like in 10 years, 15 years, we're going to say, I cannot believe that it ever was like this. We have those times in our history where we look back and, you know, before this date, everything was like this. And then afterwards, we're like, I can't believe that that's how it was allowed to be. And so I want to talk about in higher education, the essence of what we do, I think is so pure and so good and so about giving people a better future and accessibility and closing equity gaps and all of those things. But we have um, oftentimes had a problem with the form of how we're executing that. And so I want to talk about a couple of times in higher education history where something really broke and then how we fixed it moving forward and how we recognize it today. And then I also have this um, Hotel Impossible that just as we're thinking about a change in form, but being able to hold on to the essence of what is good about a thing, I think will be really useful. So oh, is, that, is, that, is that the Alpenhoff? <clears throat> No, I've already done that one with you. Listen, that one is my most favorite of all Hotel Impossibles. If anybody ever only watches one, that is the one to watch. That's my favorite too. I love that. I would do that one every week if I could. Okay, so let me talk about student conduct, which my higher education friends will recognize. We've got a lot of student conduct stuff. So a student does a thing that they're not supposed to do, and then we have to do a hearing, and then we have to do a finding, and then we have to do a sanction. Like there's all of this stuff that comes with disciplinary action at a higher education institution. What you may not know is that these things come out of actually the civil rights movement. So they are directly tied to protests about um, white only lunch counters and drinking fountains. So let me give you a quick, a quick history lesson on our student conduct issues. So in the 60s, we had a lot of students who were protesting these restaurants and these drinking fountains and they would do sit-ins. In fact, it was primarily college students who then became freedom riders, which you all know about. They were not only assaulted while they were doing those sit-ins, but also the police were called and they were put in not like the local jail, but like prison because they were doing, they were disruptive, disruptive. Okay. <clears throat> What we don't talk about a lot of times, though, is that not only students were subject to legal trouble, but also many of their schools then expelled them and made it so they could not finish their education. So they were cut off of their student status. So there's a, a really important um, uh, Dixon versus Alabama, there were six students, John Dixon, Bernard Lee, Marzell Watts, Edward English Jones, Joseph Peterson, and Elroy Embry. They were expelled from the Alabama State College by the president because they participated in a sit-in at the Montgomery Corny, uh, County Courthouse, which obviously is publicly owned. And these the, were African-American students. Yes. The, the lunchroom closed down, refused to serve them, told them to leave. They wouldn't. The police came. The governor of Alabama, who was also the chairman of the State Board of Education, called the president that day, the president of um, Alabama State College, and said, you need to expel them because they're troublemakers, basically. Um, so the next day, hundreds of students uh, marched in their defense the president said to all of the students who marched, you're disrupting our orderly business. Um, you better stop doing it or I'm going to expel all of you. So um, he, he basically said, quote, you behave yourselves and return to class. Um, later, they did this investigation by the attorney general staff and the president of the institution. And he said, the president said, I can't control these disruptions. So he expelled with no due process, nine students and suspended 20, which then sparked this lawsuit where these students said, hey, you are not allowed to expel us from a school because you don't like what we're protesting against. And the judge said, and I love this because when we talk about the essence of higher education, right? Without sufficient education, these plaintiffs would not be able to earn an adequate livelihood or fulfill as completely as possible the duties and responsibilities of good citizens. 
Um, and he said, this issue of schools being able to kick out students because they don't like what they're doing is of ext extreme great value. So eventually those students won and that's the foundation for all of our student conduct processes that say you have freedom of speech, you have freedom to protest. And just because we don't like what you're doing does not mean we're allowed to deprive you of education. And that's a great comment that he wrote about being a good citizen. But again, they won on the constitution. The constitution right. gives them the right to <clears throat> speech. That's exactly right. So what Thurgar, Thur, Thurgood Marshall, who actually represented them, he wasn't on the Supreme Court yet, but he represented them. And then later in Brown versus Board, what he said was, um, sustaining a college experience is the principal path to personal and professional growth, citizenship and leadership, which I love because the form is broken, right? We don't, presidents are not allowed to be like, hey, you can't come to school anymore because I don't like what you're saying. Right. But the essence of the constitution is education is your right. And we are not allowed to deprive you of that just because we don't like what you're doing. And, and thank God for the NAACP because they're the ones who brought him in and he did a lot of their work for them. They would find these cases and then he would come in and then he would fight these cases for them. Yeah. I saw a really great documentary on him. Uh, fantastic. Really? Yeah. Do you remember what it was? Uh, Thurgood, I think it was called. It was actually, okay. I found it on, um, I actually, in one of my trips, I was on Delta and I was, I, I watch all of the documentaries on Delta and uh, it was fascinating. He well, was, I mean, he was such a giant, not because he was on the Supreme Court only, but because he was just a giant way before he was on the Supreme Court. Absolutely. So I tell that story because so many of us are familiar with these student conduct principles. They are a foundation, like everybody on a campus knows this is why, but that came out of a place where everything was very broken. And we had people who said, nope, we're not going to do that anymore. We're going to fix that so that it's a you more know, powerful you, thing. Just off on a tangent for a second, if you think about where this country is gone in the last hundred years, I mean, you would get arrested for saying a curse word on stage if you were a comedian. You right. would get arrested. You couldn't dance if you were gay. <clears throat> you couldn't get on the bus w without getting arrested if you didn't sit in the right place. I mean, Willie Mays, Hank Garen, they were, they were, they were, you know, they, everyone loved them, but they couldn't have the same rights as, that you and I could have. So this country, as wonderful as this country is, man, it's been broken for a long time. That's right. And I like that idea of Kintsugi because it is cyclical, mm -hmm. right? So something breaks and you're like, that's a mess. We have to fix it. And then you get 20, 40, 50 years down the line and you're like, no, it's it's better than it was, but it's still look, broken. Look, look, look what's happening right now with the pandemic took everybody out of, you know, everybody's out of work. They all of a sudden, everybody's got to come back to work and everybody's desperate to have everybody back to work. And, and a lot of the young people are saying, no, thank you. I'm good. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that, whatever. So it's a, it's really, a, it's a come to terms that you've paid us seven, 8,000 an hour. Right. And you're all yelling and screaming about $15 an hour. But we're saying, how about this? How about no dollars an hour? Right. And good luck and God bless you and go find other people that are going to work. Yeah. And so it's, it, it, it's a reckoning. This will be in the history books as an employee revolution. I agree with you. Um, another example that I want to give you is about Title IX. And so Title IX, we're when all- women could go do sports and stuff? Yeah, so listen, Anthony, this is really interesting because Title IX was actually a bridge to the Civil Rights Act of 64, which covered race, color, religion, and nationality, but not sex discrimination. So it had no, it did not address women at all. And so this draft was written by the House Representative from Hawaii, Patsy Minx, and the House Representative from Oregon, Edith Green, who said, hey, you should not be able to discriminate against women in college either. And so you'll love this. It was brought to the Senate floor by this senator from Indiana in 1972. Here's what he said. Here's how. Here's argument for making Title IX law. <laughs> oh, I, I, I hope it's not what I think it's going to be. He said... We're all familiar with the stereotype that women are pretty things who go to college to find a husband, who go on to graduate school because they want a more interesting husband and finally marry, have children and never work again. The desire of many schools not to waste a man's place on a woman stems from such stereotype notions. But the facts contradict these myths about the weaker sex and it's time to change our operating assumptions. While the impact of this amendment would be far reaching, it is not a 
panacea. It is, however, an important first step in an effort to provide for women, the women of America, something that is rightfully theirs, an equal chance to attend a school of their choice, to develop the skills they want, and to apply those skills with the knowledge that they have a fair chance to secure jobs of their choice with equal pay for equal work. Thank you. So he actually said it. He said something smart. Yeah, he did. He he was like, hey, everybody thinks that women are just pretty and they need a husband and they're going to stay home with their kids, but they should be able to do what they want. And isn't that the amendment that also allowed them to have, like, if you have a baseball team for, for men, you have to have a team yes. for women? Here's what's hilarious about that, though, Anthony. The only reason that people think of Title IX as being applied primarily to coll collegiate sports is because this man, this congressman, John Tower, proposed an amendment when they passed it that said, that's fine, women can go to college, but obviously male sports are more important. So can we like give, can we give athletics a pass and say women don't need to have equal opportunity there? And there was such an uproar about him saying that, that so many people now think of Title IX primarily about athletics because he was like, oh, but no one wants to watch women play. So can we just like say, but of course they're not going to play. Well, I want to thank him for allowing my daughter to play D3. Volleyball. Right, <laughs> right. That's what, that backfired, sir. John Tower backfired. And his yeah, listen, when I, even when I was a kid, there wasn't a lot of women playing sports. And yeah. now like all my daughter's <laughs> friends played sports. Yeah. So you just think about this is another place where that's broken. Like we're not letting women in because they're going to be taking spots for men. And somebody is like, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. We're going to let women in. And here we are. What did I say? Uh, 60, no, 72. Here we are 40 something years later. And we're like, is that real life? That was real life. Women couldn't go to college and play sports. Well, you know, what's, what's interesting is, you know, most people walking around today, History to them was last Saturday. Like they have no understanding. I, like the other day I was using GPS. I don't know if I told you this. And my daughter said um, something. And I was like, man, I, I, I hated reading maps. I'm so glad for GPS. She goes, you didn't have GPS when you were a kid? What did you do? I was like, Read no, maps. I didn't have GPS when I was a kid. <laughs> like, well, how did you find where you were going? I said, go to the gas station and ask a guy that doesn't know yeah. where it is, where it is, and get lost for three hours and get, and right. get divorced by the time you get there. <laughs> <laughs> that's really funny because my daughter and I were playing with Snapchat filters last night. Uh -huh. And I was thinking how she thinks that's just a thing that exists. Well, I'm like still amazed. I'm like, how do they do that? That's really Listen, <laughs> what we're doing right now is George Jetson stuff. <laughs> right. True. Very true. So- I would just like to say, I love the idea that although we've been through something really hard and the world has been broken, things have been broken before and we get like stronger at the broken places, right? And and then in 20 years, they break again and we fix it again and we fix it again and we just get progressively better. And I think the essence of higher education is so good and pure and we've had some form issues we haven't done it right we haven't done it equally we've got a lot of equity issues and systemic issues we have to address but i like the idea that we can address it in form and that we can feel really certain about the rights of people to be educated and to be good citizens and leaders and career development and student development and all of those pieces i think it's really powerful so absolutely okay so let's talk about your hotel Okay. Here it is. Oh, 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 really? Wow. It's the Ritz Inn. Wow. Okay. Oh, this man. Is I just, just lost it. Like you could put up 108 pictures, one of every <laughs> show I did, and I will have a visceral reaction to everyone. It just all comes back to you, right? Okay. So this is Watt and Megan Wee. They are in um, Niagara Falls in Canada. I think they came... I. I didn't write this down. I think they came from C Cambodia or Tibet. I can't remember. Do What's you remember? That? Do you remember again. if they came from Cambodia or Tibet? I'm going to, I think it's Cambodia. Okay. I think I would remember Tibet. <clears throat> okay. So they bought this hotel. Remember, we're talking about form versus spirit or versus essence. Okay. So I want to talk about form first. Because no, we I, I almost forgot about this hotel. I almost forgot about this whole thing. Oh, wow. We have some serious issues. So they are a hotel. They used to sell ice cream. They don't anymore. But they have <laughs> out in front. I'm taking a picture. Um, they, let's see what else. They are an internet 
cafe. It's it's like crazy. They have crazy town stuff going on. You were asking for some intervention here. Um, I think this is before you went in to see them and they're okay. So I'm trying to see, it's like, they sell drink snacks, wooden masks, lighters, ice cream. It's an internet cafe. This is their little setup with their monitor and their keyboard. You are hilarious because they sell, they sell these masks. They have this picture up that says, um, all for sale puppet masks. And you said, how many said, of those, I don't remember. You said, well, how many of those do you sell a day? And she was like, I don't think we've ever sold any of them, right? Still remember, we're talking about form. Here is their emergency phone, which they have duct tape over, which you were like, why do you have duct tape over the emergency phone? And she was like, I don't know. Then she tells you that they have a wedding chapel because it's Niagara Falls. Oh my God. So this is your face as you're like, where's the wedding chapel? She's like, it's in a room. There's a bed in there. If somebody wants to get married, we take the bed out. But otherwise it's just a room. And you're like, you, okay. you know, You know what's interesting about that phone? I pride myself on remembering every single detail of every single show. I don't remember that phone. Okay. Well, Here's what I also think is weird is that it's emergency. I think it's supposed to be tele T E L E like telephone, oh. but it says help, help, which could be help or it could be telephone. I'm not really sure what they mean, but you were just like, seriously, why is that like that? No, but okay. you know what? I literally have no recollection of that phone. And it's well, there was a crazy. lot of other stuff going on. So I can, no, but I remember every scene, <laughs> but I don't remember of every show, but that I don't remember that phone. It must've been very, you know what it was? Honestly, behind the scenes, I was having a really big problem with my producer, and I think I was just so aggravated. Yeah. Okay. Well, more form. You go to the wedding chapel. This is for people to get married at Niagara Falls, room 113. You walk in and literally walked out. So you opened the door and looked at it and were like, nope, and walked out and then came back, like got it together, came back. I do remember that. Look at because my face. And then just so you know, that's real. I've never seen it before. Okay, well, here's what you saw. That's a wedding I don't even chapel. know how to describe it, Anthony. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a wedding chapel. That's a wedding chapel. So they take the bed out, which that's kind, but I don't even know how to describe it. It's like there's this parrot that doesn't work. There's like these little bears. There's a stained glass window. There also is a treadmill and a freezer and a table and chairs. I don't form. We've got some form issues. I'm getting here. ill. I'm really physically getting ill again. It was pretty bad. Okay. More form issues. You had a pool, which wasn't bad, but when you look behind that. the fence, it was a trap. Like they just tr put all their trash there. They also on the front of the hotel had a, <laughs> everyone's going to think we're making this up. We're totally not making it up. They had an awning with a different hotel name and a room full of junk, right? And here are the rooms. <clears throat> I think this, uh, to be fair, this is an upgraded room. Yes. <laughs> um, which you examined the lamp in their room that they upgraded for $1,000 and it disintegrated, right? Okay, so I wanna stop there because on its face, this hotel is a total wreck. 100%. I don't feel like I can overstate that. No, not only a total wreck, it's people who think they're doing exactly the right thing. Right. That's what's hurtful the most is like, this is what works. This is, this is good. Like, right. Like, like what? Like, it, well, it's, it's completely being disillusioned. Right. So one of the examples is he took a thousand dollars to renovate that room, but he spent most of it in insulation because he was going to save money on heat. And you're like, that is the total wrong thing to do. That does not help anybody. You're not going to get a better, um, you know, trip advisor review. That's the wrong thing to do. Okay. But I want to talk about essence because we're talking about changing form and still respecting the essence or the core of this thing. This couple, um, so some really strong cultural rules about, I don't think anyone had ever seen him cry before, 
you said, which I, it seemed like in the show, like as you saw how gutted he was, so you had your reviews and you're like, I'm just going to read the titles to you because you're so sad and overwhelmed. There's no, like, I don't have to convince you that this is a total wreck, right? They owed $250,000 to the bank, $500,000 to their family, plus they were borrowing from their daughter. Yep. And as you were talking about like, hey, you're not making money, you owe this money. He just started crying. And she was like, you said, I don't think this is something he does. And she's like, I don't know that I've ever seen him cry before. She was very tender towards him, right? And you were like, this is why I'm not yelling. This is why I'm not mad because these people are just completely overwhelmed and don't know what to do. And I was thinking about, Anthony, how many times in your show, like, you come across really strong because what you have to do is get a person to to listen to you. It's like you're always talking about the tools in your toolkit. Like, I have to stand up to you. I have to tell you. I have to be harsh so that you will listen to me so we can fix it. But in this case, they were so broken. And also, they really loved each other. Like, she was very gentle with him. And although there were some, like, hierarchical issues with her or with him saying, like, I'm the boss. You're not supposed to be telling me what to do. She really loved him. She was really tender towards him. Um, there were good bones in there. So, so were his, so were his kids. Yeah. So that's the next piece, right? Is that you came to his kids and you were like, this is your father crying. Did you have any idea? And they all were like, oh my gosh, we did not know. We love yeah, him. Right. We want to help him. Yeah. And they never knew, like they, they didn't know the pain he was in. And, and listen, <clears throat> where they're from their culture there's the, the the he is the head of the household and everyone falls in line right and they've been americanized they've grew up in this country and they're like this is a bunch of crap we just want to help them and we want him we appreciate everything that did all the kids are educated all the kids are doing well and they were, were the loveliest kids loveliest young people i've i've met i mean yeah just i fell in love with them well i love this family because it is a great example of everything wrong with form like honestly the first 45 minutes is all of the crazy business decisions they're making in terms of form but at their core and at their heart they're really good people they really oh. love each other they're committed yeah, i lo love in fact you're bringing back my i love those kids i literally love those kids well they, they would do anything they were what this lady the, the girl in the on the far uh top left uh, who's crying. She was just a delightful person. She was yeah. just so, she wanted to help so badly. Well, I love your solution for this because you were like, Hey, I'm going to help you. Like we always do with fixing the rooms and that sort of thing. But because the family was so good and pure and their essence was right. You said to the kids like, okay, we're going to give you the, the deciding vote. So we are going to make it so that your mom, who's really good at customer service, because she was smart, like she had a lot of really good ideas. She knew what needed to be done. And then the dad was more on the maintenance side. And you're like, they're going to have disagreements. You four kids together are going to have the deciding vote, which just to be clear, there are a lot of families that you've worked with on Hotel Impossible where that would have been a total disaster solution because they're not a good family. They're not committed to each other, right? Right. And then when you said that, this is the part I don't know if I can do without crying. When the dad, when you were like, hey, they want to help you. They're going to be committed to you. And he was like, this has never happened before. I have never thought about the fact that I have such a lovely family who can support me. I don't just have to support them. I mean, he was totally overwhelmed with the like, you don't have to stand alone and stand up under all this pressure. We love you and we want to be useful to you. He was so overcome. It's, it's, it brings tears to my eyes now because as a father of three daughters and you know head of a household, and, well, actually my wife's the head of the household, but I'll make believe I am. And um, it, it, you do feel like you don't need help from your children. You don't need help from your family. I got this. And yeah. when you do have those weak moments, you're like, like, am I a weak man? And so right. um, it's, it, 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 was, it brings me back to that. And it was uh, unbelievable to, to feel that. And that's one of the reasons I love the show. I, lo I love experiencing these real emotions with these real families that are just trying to figure it out. Yeah. So it was a really nice way to, to make the father see that it was, they were a good family and that we can adjust like form stuff. So you guys did, I think you redid um, the room, you so this is the I think this is the wedding chapel, which I know was not your favorite. 
Um, let's just put it this way. I, the designer and me, um, we did never worked again together after that, I believe. Um, well, yes, that's what I, I was like. At. That is the worst upgrade of a bad chapel. I, yeah, I was very unhappy. And again, I don't give direction. I just show up at the end and go, oh boy. Okay. As a matter of fact, my producer, the reason I got mad is because my producer kept on trying to keep me out of the room. Every time I went to do an inspection in that room, the more I did the inspection, the more she chased me out of there. Yeah. Well, you guys addressed for him. You did the chapel, you did the room, you did the front desk. Um, and those are the easy things. And I like, so the opportunity for this family to get those issues uh, fixed is that you didn't have to spend time addressing their spirit or their essence or their family dynamics, which sometimes it's like 55% of the show is you trying to get two sisters to talk to each other without being awful to each other. Well, you know what most, I mean? Mostly it's 90% of the show for <laughs> me because it's 90% of my job and the rest of the show is the designer. Yeah. So this one I thought was really lovely because it was a family that you're like, we could fix the rooms. That's not the thing. You have this really beautiful thing that I think we can capitalize on. Okay, so I want to bring us back to higher education. Um, Victor Tinto, who is the father of retention and student success, again, as we're thinking about a time when things were broken, retention and student success came out of his insistence that access to higher education without support is not an opportunity for anyone. And so schools have to be investing in how they are going to keep students successful, how they're going to allow them to succeed, because just letting them in without supporting them doesn't do anything um, for you. So this idea of access without support, it's not an uh, opportunity, I think is really important. And for the fall, we're going to be diving into some of the things that he said about how to support our students, um, understanding that the essence of higher education is really, really important, but we have some form issues um, that have been uncovered over COVID. And, and what I love about this Kintsugi process is that it's going to be a continual process. Things break and we address them and then they break again and then we address them. And it's a skill set that we really need to be able to um, discipline ourselves in so that we can continually make things better. So he has some things here that we'll be talking about in the fall um, for uh, all of this, I think came out of Vincent Tinto's uh, speech for a school in Australia, but being able to go through each of these and talk about how we can do them for our students, I think is gonna be a way that we progress forward. Um, and then if you guys are thinking about any of those other steps that we've talked about for Kintsugi, I think May 25th is the first date that we started talking about that. So we have a lot of those um, webinars that you can go if you wanna look at the specific things. I, I think I wanna end with this idea of, we have in the history of this country and the history of higher education, we have weathered a lot of storms. So this quote, um, and once the storm is over, you won't remember how you made it through, how you managed to survive. You won't even be sure whether the storm is really over. But one thing is certain, when you come out of the storm, you won't be the same person who walked in. And that is what the storm is all about. And so this idea that we go through the storm and we come out and we're different and then we go through another storm and we address things and we're better and we're stronger, I think is such a powerful way to remember our history and then also have context for what's going on. Man, listen, it, it, it's what's happening right now with COVID, right? You're like, were we even in that storm? Like what happened? Is yeah. it over? What's going on? And like, it's like, I don't know what happened, but I know I'm different than the guy that went into that storm 18 months ago. Absolutely. I don't know if you're having this weird thing where like, I'm trying to remember back to last year at this time and I'm having a very hard time remembering. Yeah. Um, you know what? Because I think for me, I'll just talk for me, for me, it's, um, it was a complete shutdown. It was, even though I did things and even though I, I was still working, um, it was a complete shutdown of my competitiveness. Yeah. So of my trying to get to the next level, trying to do this or trying to whatever, it's like it was a complete shutdown of my um, ambition. It was more of, of, of survival right? and just trying to keep everybody around me calm. So like it, like you're literally a zombie walking around, just kind of getting through the motions to not screw anything up worse and yeah. to save everybody around you. So for me, it was very much a shut off switch. And, and I, yeah. Uh, and I think also there's like the rhythm of seasons 
right? Like holidays and like it's summer and then we do this and then we know, and I don't, I I feel like I don't have any of those markers to be like July 4th last year. What did I do? I stayed in my house, right? Christmas, my, I, 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 two days before Christmas, we got the word that my daughters were positive for COVID. So we, we had a lockdown Christmas. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of things that coming out of this season, not only professionally, but also personally, you know, our grandkids are going to be really interesting, interested to hear what we remember and what our experiences are. But also I think there are going to be a lot of things that they're like, before COVID, you did what? Like, like you said, like you, you had a map or you, you know, whatever those things are going to be. You worked for 8,000 an hour. (laughs) (laughs) Right. right. And then afterwards, they're going to be like, those are places where things change significantly because you realize you did not want to go to that job anymore. And so you stopped or you realized that that was not the trajectory for your life. And so you stopped doing it. Right. I, I just hope that people really understand what happened because like a, a friend, or I just read something or saw something. Uh, a, a, a woman was 103 years old. Now think of what a 103 year old woman saw, right? Jeez. She saw everything. Yeah. And they said she had the best positive attitude in the world is because she's been through right. pandemics, wars, tsunamis, hell right. and back. And she's still like 103 years. It's like, think about, like, as I'm getting, I said to somebody the other day, it's like, I'm 56 years old and I'm as excited about life as I've ever been, but it, it's kind of intense. <laughs> True. <laughs> but, but, you know, I just don't let my mind allow that in, but like, sometimes just kind of, like, this stuff is intense. Well, and I think what you said is exactly right, because as we recognize that things break and then they get addressed and then they break, what it gives you is this hope that we're going to continually progress instead of what it can feel like when you're in the middle of it, which is like, this is it. This is, it's never going to get better, right? So if you have the perspective of a hundred years to say like, it broke here, it broke here, it broke here, and yet... I have a family that loves me. I'm still able to do things that I want. It gives you that kind of important perspective. You know, I just I just posted something from Tim Grover, who was like the the person that helped MJ and um, all the big athletes overcome their 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 mind blocks, and says, "Crave the re- results so intensely that the work becomes irrelevant." Mm-hmm. So if you really really want to do something badly, the pandemic and all the stuff you have to go through to get to that end result. Yeah, it's just it's inconsequential because it's part of it, my my dream is so intense. Everything else doesn't matter. Awesome. And I thought that was beautifully said. And so yeah. it's true. It's like 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 I we, we, when I turn around, so whatever I do in my life, it's like yeah, whatever. I worked eighteen hours a day today. I, I went through hell with the union, whatever. But I'm committed to this outcome, like, so I'm doing like it. That. It's like okay, next. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I like you, Anthony. um thank you for spending time with me today next week we are off because i am on vacation so that will be very fun are you on vacation now lady on vacation i'm going i'm going to mexico where that's a loom no no oh man no i wish i'm going to cancun cancun which is 45 minutes from tulum oh well then maybe i'll take a little trip yeah are you going to one of the caves (laughs) should i you absolutely. Oh, okay. Well, let me write it down. Anthony says go to the cave. Yeah, go to the one with the um the pool. Go watch my show Five Star Secrets Discovery Plus. Okay. Uh, the one um it's called uh, I think it's the Treehouse one. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, because it's kind of like a treehouse, or maybe it's a Five Star Secret. No, it's I think it's a Treehouse one. Okay. Um, Tulum, Mexico, um, and look at that hotel, and then look at the, all the I forgot what they call them. Like so, excursions. No, so so whatever. Um, look at that, and you'll see a lot of things to do when you're okay. around. Okay, I will do it. So we will take next week off. I will take pictures. Um, next time we're together, I'll show them to everybody. Um, otherwise, I think we can be encouraged that although things are broken, we're going to come out stronger and more beautiful on the other end. So thank it's you. It's all about for- perspective and mindset. Absolutely. Thanks for spending time with me. Thank you guys. We'll see you later. Bye. Bye guys.